chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. The man who many know by name. They have stories about him. In the New Testament, he is so well known that many people try to imitate him. Even in the church age, many men of God have tried to say that they are this person because he was so mightily used, mightily used of God. And his name is Elijah. Let's consider his life and how God used him this morning. First Kings chapter 17. Verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel live, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. That was the beginning of his ministry. Suddenly out of the blue, seemingly from nowhere, comes a man from Tishbite, say the Tishbite. And uh, here he comes out of the unknown province in Israel, enter the king's court, the highest court in the land, confronts the king and say, O oh, king, there will be no rain until I say so. Could you imagine there was a king sitting on his throne? And there was Elijah coming forth. The king has authority in the land. He could give a command and people will be sentenced to death. Give a command and people will be put in prison. I mean the king has authority on this earth. As far as his country was concerned, there is a country of the of Israel, the northern kingdom. And here comes that man, Elijah, who faces the king and says, King, you control the web you control the country, I control the weather. That's a good bargain. And this land is full of idolatry. This land is full of sin. So king, I'll tell the weather, don't give rain. And he will not give rain until I say so. What an introduction. That's the first time you hear of him in the Bible. Where did he come from? What did he do to give him this authority? I'm sure many of you would wish that you got authority over the weather like he had. Some of you pray for the rain to stop and you go wet. And in some countries like India and Africa, they would have wished that there was an Elijah who could pray down the rain. And I believe in the last days, we are going to have restored on the church all the mantles. The mantle is the anointing. In other words, all the anointings in the Old Testament and the New Testament are all going to be present in the last revival. You're going to have some people walking about like Elijah. You're going to have some people walking about like Elijah. Now, hear me, they are not Elijah, they are not Elijah, but they carry the mantle, the anointing on their life. There's some of them going to walk about like Jeremiah, but oh Lord, don't make me an Isaiah. If you read Isaiah and the things he did, say Lord, not me. Give it to Brother Albert or somebody else. Uh, the anointing on Isaiah, but it was powerful, brother. It was powerful. And of all the books in the Old Testament that were quoted in the New Testament, the book of Isaiah is quoted the most frequently. So he had the word of God on his mouth, but it was strange things he did. 
strange things like getting a child Malaysianized the scripture it got a sarong bury it in the ground and then wear the loin, cro- loin cloth the let me see you taught me the word goti oh waste I got I mixed up the goats with the weight. Right, so he got his waist tea eh? and he buried in the ground until his tea smells like lem- Lemberger tea like a durian chair for 10, 10, 10 years open and then he wears it and says the judgment of God is on you and of course they will have a very hard time differentiating the anointing on him and the smell on him that's a mental on Isaiah and there are many different mentors but every one of those mentors in the Old Testament are going to be restored today you have the old man of God living each age, each time of their man of God and the particular mentor in the last days all these mentors all through the years God is going to take them up and He's going to put them all on the last day church aren't you glad to be living today? Amen. Maybe you argue Jesus a clever offering. Oh, I'm glad to be living today. I'm glad that I'm living in this last day when we are going to meet Jesus face to face and many of us are not even going to see that. We're just going to say, Hello Jesus, here we go. Praise God. Just raptured into the heavens. But there are some things that this man of God has discovered that to receive the mentor that they have on their life, we must know what they went through, we must know what they go through, and we must understand how they receive those mentors. Here was Elijah, seemingly out of nowhere, he received a mentor. How did he get it? The key was given to us in the New Testament. See, the Old Testament is the new concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi is a new concealed it is hidden in shadows and types and the New Testament is the old revealed unto us so there are many things in the Old Testament that they see only a little here, a little there, that God gives more light in the New Testament. In the book of James chapter 5, if you have your Bible, James chapter 5, right before 1 Kings 17 verse 1, is James chapter 5. It says in verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Now that is before 1 Kings 17 verse 1. Before Elijah confronted King Ahab, he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer before he was a prophet. He was a prayer before he was a prophet. And if you have a call of God on your life, the most important thing in your life is to be a prayer warrior before you're an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist or a teacher or a pastor. To be a man or woman of prayer. And I, I don't care what God has called you to or what desire of the office that God has placed in your heart by the Holy Ghost. But if you are not a person of prayer, you will never ever enter into what God asks you to do. If Elijah failed in being a man of prayer, he will never have gone into the pro- office of a prophet. He may even be called but there are many that are called with the gifts and calling of God on their life but who die who live and die without entering into that which God has for them why did he pray for no rain? 
if you understand the Israelite history which I will just give you briefly in Israel when the kingdom was broken into two after King Solomon the northern kingdom was taken by uh, Jeroboam and the southern kingdom was by Rehoboam Jeroboam and Rehoboam and Jeroboam because he was afraid that the people will defect to the southern kingdom politically he built a golden calf the same one that the Israelites were destroyed by God because they worshipped in the wilderness he built it and he said worship this this is your God so there was a beginning of idol worship in Israel after King Solomon not the beginning I mean Solomon also did some terrible things he started idol worship but there was an official political a beginning of a whole nation worshipping idolatry in Solomon's time it was mixed mixed now fully the whole northern kingdom followed idolatry that was bad enough but then comes King Ahab here comes King Ahab and he married Jezebel Jezebel a beautiful name but that, that lady really destroyed that name and uh, Jezebel influenced King Ahab to bring the idols from her old background her hidden background into Israel and in King Ahab's time was the first time that they began worshipping Baal Baal was a symbol of Satan Baal is a symbol of Satan you read in the Old Testament Baal, sons of Belial, etc he is a symbol of Satan it was Satan worship now not just idol worship but it was satanic worship completely and so they institutional, uh, institutionalized everything and uh, make it an official thing here they had a golden calf they had a Baal worship and here was Elijah he could have been an ordinary person like you and I minding his own business trying to do his best to please his mighty Jehovah God and every day as he walked the streets the official religion was Baal worship now under, under the auspices of the mighty king Ahab and Queen Jezebel and here it is as an ordinary I believe he was just an ordinary ordinary follower of the true and living God Jehovah and as he was going about every day he sees this happening and he must have grieved his heart before prayer is revelation he sends the sin in war before you can pray with great intercession you must sense the sin I mean the, the fallen nature and the imperfections are around you they grieve you so much and you turn to God in prayer you must be so offended by all these things some people are so hardened to sin that they are no more grief at sin like in today in western society I mean they have even changed the, the name of certain things to make it sound better they are so hardened to it uh, he was grieved that all these things and other words he was taking place and he started a prayer marathon he was probably alone in that he didn't know there were many others who were also grieved probably uh, he prayed and pray and pray and he had God's word what did Elijah base on to pray for the stopping of the rain he had God's word God's word back him up God's word back him up turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy in the law of God that was given to the Israelites verse 23 verse 23 talking about the curse that will come on the Israelites if they disobey God and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you shall be iron 
The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Now that was God's written word. God's written word about the nation of Israel. God said, you obey me, I will bless you. You disobey me, this is what will happen. So when Elijah read the scriptures, the word of God, he knew that God would want to withhold the rain as a judgment for the nation of Israel. See, the mentor that was on Elijah was he was a prophet to the nation. And here he was praying for the nation. And while he was praying for the nation, he had the word of God. The Bible tells us in James 5, he prayed for no rain. What was the reason? I believe because he wanted the opportunity to bring the word to the people. God said there will be no rain, but this is what happened. Not only was there no rain, God gave one man the authority to stop the rain. In James chapter 5. See, he prayed. He must have asked God for the authority. He prayed for no rain. Why? He wanted to tell the people to turn back to God. His motives were right. Now let me caution you here. As you move into prophecy and open yourself to the things of God, don't think that you're prophet Elijah all the time. Sometimes people scold you through their prophecy. Have you ever heard of that? I mean, I don't like you to say, God says the Lord, you nasty rascal. So please, prophecy exhorts, comfort and edifies. For example, if I want you to do something, I don't purposely bring a prophecy to you and say, God says God, you're supposed to be more kind to me. You're being very, very uh, rascal, uh, rascal. And uh, you're being... Uh, very uh, disobedient and you have been uh, uh, very hard-hearted, uh, etc. I'm not giving you a prophecy, I'm scolding you through the prophecy. That is spiritual intimidation. And sometimes we also have spiritual extortion. Ever heard of that? He come to you and say, God is a word for you. In your third drawer at home, there is a piece of jewel. God says to take it out, bring it here, give it to me. And he says, wow, word of knowledge, you got it. Quickly go, take that piece of jewel and give it to that guy. You have just been extorted. It's a spiritual form of extortion. These are all crooks and teeth. Wolves in sheep skin. Hello there. You can smell them out by their words. Anyway, when we are talking about Elijah stopping the rain, etc., his motives were right. His motives were right. He was not trying to promote himself. He was not trying to uh, control people's lives. But his desire was to turn the nation to God. Prophecy cannot be used to control another person's life. It is wrong. So notice the difference. That there is a difference between that says the Lord and between I perceive. Paul says when they were going out into uh, the sea, he was a prisoner in the ship and he told the captain on the ship in Acts chapter 28, I perceive that this journey will be dangerous. He did not say that says the Lord. There's a difference between perceiving discernment and that says the Lord. I believe we got to honor God. Amen? I believe we got to treasure the word of God. I believe we got to make people respect a prophecy. But we can, we can make people dishonor prophecy by misusing the word that says the Lord. Hello there. Thank you for those silent amen. We have to know that here was Elijah. His purpose was not to control. His purpose was not to exalt himself. 
He was just grieved at the sin of idolatry in his nation. And so he prayed in James chapter 5. He cried out to God. He said, God, stop the rain. I don't know how long he prayed, but he must have prayed for some time. He was a man of prayer. Finally, finally, God must have spoken to him and said, All right, Elijah, I have heard you. According to your word, it shall be. So then you have him coming in 1 Kings 17. Coming to the king and saying, O oh, king, there will be no rain unless I say so. Good day. And he walked off. Strange looking man in that a sheep king. He didn't even have nice clothing that like you and I have. The funny looking odd man and uh, there he is declare and I'm sure the odd must say ha prophet I'm sure none of them will believe him the next day there was no rain and the following day there was no rain on the third day there was no rain the following week when there was no rain one month there was no rain they start worrying they were so worried after one year there was no rain the king was so desperate because that man who disappeared say only and my word there will be rain finally they believe him they send out spies all over the land of Israel and all along the, the surrounding countries to look for him to bring back the rain let me show you the reference in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. This is what Obadiah, the general, said up to Elijah when Elijah appeared to him. Verse 10. Chapter 18, verse 10. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master, that is King Ahab, has not sent someone to hunt for you. They were looking for him all over the place. He said, as long as there's a country, as long as there's a neighboring nation, as long as we know there's such a country and nation, King Ahab has sent his people to look for you. Imagine how desperate they were. After all this strange looking man called Elijah said, There will be no rain unless I say so. That's authority, brother. That's authority and power. So he has sent to every nation and they could not find him. Here is Obadiah and, his, and when they say he is not here he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find, you, find him. That means when they went to a nation nearby for example they could go to Syria and, and confront the king of Syria and say Oh king of Syria is Elijah here? The king of Syria would say No! And they wouldn't believe. They say, King of Syria, swear, swear to me that he's not here before they leave. They were desperately looking for him because they now realize how powerful he was. Now where did he get his power? Through prayer. Say, Elijah got his power through prayer. And you must understand that prayer always gets what he wants. If you really understand prayer, and we're talking about prayers in line with the word, you understand the force of prayer, there is no such thing as a no. Prayer prevails until the answer. While the king was looking all over for him, Elijah was having a very nice time at the brook, a little stream right in Israel. 
If God doesn't want you to be found, you cannot be found. If God wants to hide you, you can be hidden. So, here in 1 Kings 17, Elijah was told by God to go to the brook Kidron. And in verse 5, uh, verse 3 to 5, get away from here, turn eastward, hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. While the king was looking all over for him, he was having a good time, enjoying the scenery, having all his meals served by the waiters, the black waiters, ravens, and uh, he would just bring all his meals to him and he enjoyed, and the water was there for him, everything provided there for him, nice hotel terrace. One day, because of the drought and the lack of rain, the whole brook dried up. So God said, Go to a widow of Zarephath. Go to her. For I have told her to feed you. Notice first Kings 17. God says in verse 9, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So when Elijah went to see the widow, the widow was ready to perform the last meal, the last funeral rite, and die. Imagine how long it must have been, it must have been quite some time, maybe a year or more, when the brook dried up, because everyone in the nation was now feeling the effects of the lack of rain. And when he saw the widow, the widow saw him, he spoke first and said, Give me some water. And the widow, and then in verse 11, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And the widow said, We are ready to eat the last meal and die. We are just right at the ending. Imagine God's timing is so perfect. The brook dried up, she was having her last meal. Why didn't he come to her uh, when she had uh, many meals left? But he came right at the time when he had the last meal. Isn't it wonderful? God sent Elijah, a man with a need, to a widow with a seed, and both their needs are met. She had a seed. Elijah came and said, Sow your seed. Give me a morsel of bread and a drink. And the most remarkable thing is verse 9. God told Elijah, I have already commanded her. Do you see that verse there? God says in verse 9, I have commanded. Say God has commanded that we do. But she was dead. She was dead to God. She didn't hear. If she heard from God, she would have been waiting for Elijah and say, You are the one God told me. Not everybody hears God's instruction. Not everybody is sensitive to what God is telling them. She didn't know what God said. She didn't hear what God said. But God said, I have told her. Her hearing was having problems. Her ears were not tuned to God. You know what was the problem? She was looking to her circumstances, not looking to God. If she looked to God, she would have heard God. But she was seeing her circumstances all the time. She didn't know deliverance was coming. Anyway, to make a long story short, here comes Elijah, and there they could leave right through the end of the drought miraculously. Imagine, they need a miracle every day just to survive. The water, the, the flour, and everything that is needed, 
there is a requirement of a daily miracle because there was only enough physically for one meal. So every day they need to walk so close to God, otherwise they are finished. If Elijah backslide, the widow backslide, finish, die of starvation. I like that kind of walk. I don't know about you. But I would rather walk close to God and uh, if I'm disobedient with God, so be it. Then all the things are cut off. Then, to have one hand on the world and one hand on God and say, if God doesn't come through, I see God this one here. If you want to see the miracles of God, you have to put everything of your trust in God. The miracle will not come to a divided hearted person, a double minded person. You have to fully trust God. Faith is an act. Faith is a fact. Faith is an act. Faith is also a risk you take. But in a sense, it is not a risk. Because if you know the word, He always comes through. But to your natural mind, there's a risk involved. Like Peter stepping out of the water is a risk of drowning. But thanks be to God, the day you learn to take one hand off the world and put both hands on God, the miracle comes forth. The miracle comes forth. Every day they needed a miracle. Finally, three years ended. Elijah knew, now was the time to bring back the rain. Remember he had prayed for no rain. It required him to pray for rain to settle everything. But by now, the judgment was full. The word had come to pass. The heavens were as bronze. Everything was powder and dark. God sent him to Ahab. Here was a man. They were looking left, right, center, all, all over the nations for him. He suddenly comes back and shows himself. In 1 Kings 18, and he says to Obadiah, and Obadiah was a very nice, kind man. The only pity is that he worked under a terrible master. In verse 2, verse 1 and 2, God says to Elijah, Go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Notice, God said, I will send the rain. You and God do the miracles together. If you study miracles and you do a thorough study of miracles in the Bible, you will notice this. Every miracle is a cooperation of a human being with the Almighty Sovereign God. Every miracle that the Almighty God did, there was always a small part required of a human being. It could take five loaves and two fishes. It could be the rod of Moses. It, it could be a word of a man. There is a part that is required of us. Every miracle that God wrought, there is a cooperation between God and man. When you pray for a miracle, you must also ask God, what is my part in the miracle? Don't just pray for a miracle, ask God, what is your part in the miracle? Because there will be your part in the miracle. And then God does the rest. Thank God, He, he do the harder part, we do the easy part. Just a small little thing that He asks us to do, He do the big, great thing. But, although He is so great and mighty, he still enjoys to have us, his little children, do our little part. Never, never pray for a miracle and leave out what you are to do on your part to bring about the miracle. He came and presented himself to Obadiah and said, I'm here now. Obadiah got a shock in his life. He said, here you are. You asked me to go to that bad king, Ahab. And say, Elijah is here. Well, I'm God, please have mercy on me. Because we're looking all over for you and we cannot find you. Please have mercy for, for, on me. Because King Ahab will have me killed. 
When I come back and, and don't find you, he will have me killed. He said, please have mercy on me. Be kind to me. Poor soul. Full of fear. Good man, but full of fear. And Elijah said, Elijah said, verse 15, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. Second confrontation. Elijah is now known throughout the nation of Israel. Here he is declaring himself before King Ahab. And I like the conversation. When Ahab saw him, three years had passed since he has last seen him. When Ahab saw him, Ahab said, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? He put the blame on Elijah and said, You disturb all of us. Elijah said, I have not troubled Israel. You and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baal. But, send and gather Israel to me on Mount Carmel and 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So, he says, we are going to confront each other now, the man of God, against 850 false prophets. Wow. So, like we say, you can never just go by the majority because the majority can be wrong. One prophet against 850 false prophets. They climb all the way up to Mount Carmel. And right on Mount Carmel, Elijah knew, God said, I will send rain. Even though God said, I will send rain, he knew that God wanted him to do something. He knew his path. Many of you have received God's promises. Many of you have received God's prophecy to your life. God said, I will do this for you. I will do that for you. I will do this in your life. I will bring this to pass. But you stop there. You did not ask God, God, what part do I have to do? You have just sat down and, uh, you know, on your rocking chair. Excuse me, you got a rocking chair. And you just take your legs and say, Oh God, you promise it, you're going to do it, you're going to send rain, you're going to send rain, you promise it. And you did not ask God to show you what is your part in a miracle. If Elijah had just said, good Father, you're a uh, good Almighty Jehovah, you're going to send rain, and you just sat down, nothing would have happened. A lot of the prophecies in your life are not just going to happen like that. They need a part of your cooperation with God. Your part. Your five loads and two pieces, he'll take care of the five thousand. So Elijah knew what God wanted him to do. They all gathered together and he was very good. He said, now you all four, eight hundred and fifty prophets, you all do your, give a try first. You do it first. You try to bring rain. If you are, if you are the true prophet, you bring the rain. You bring the rain, and he must be greening away. So all the other prophets, they started their ritual. That's in First Kings. First Kings, chapter 18. There they are together. And so verse 26, 25, 26, Elijah said to the prophet, Go and... Choose one book for yourself, prepare it first, and then you can call on whatever God you have. You can call on whatever God you have, do your best, and uh, you bring the rain. Those poor, poor prophets, they screamed, they shouted, they danced, and they prayed, and they cried, but all to the wrong God. Nothing happened. 
By that time, it was 27, it was 12 o'clock, noon. Elijah said, Cry louder! Lah. Your God is maybe doing some meditation. Or he's too busy. Or he's on a long journey. Didn't come back yet. Or maybe your God is sleeping, snoring. Cry louder so he can wake up. I like him. He's not afraid of false God. And I would encourage each one of you, don't be afraid of idols. Don't be afraid of destroying destroying charms and idols. They cannot do anything to harm you. Some people have the world concept or the unrenewed mind. For example, some people say, Oh, this is a tiny charm, more powerful than Malaysian charm. What difference does it make? So, if you believe it, then it's why it affects you. You must train yourself like Paul said, you must receive knowledge that an idol is nothing. Nothing to be afraid. No matter how terrifying it looks, look eyeball to eyeball. Do not be afraid. You're destroying all the things, getting rid of all the charms that put it in the bondage. Just go ahead. They, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. You say, but brother, sometimes they follow me back. According to your faith, be unto you. Somebody told you that you believe it, so is it unto you. They told me that the first time when I entered the deliverance ministry. And uh, so those thoughts sometimes come to you, those thoughts of fear. But I said, Jesus didn't experience that, so why should I? The disciples didn't experience that, so why should I? Say, I am a child of God. Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. I mean, just the other time, uh, just uh, last week, wasn't it, that uh, Bob Weiss was saying about some, uh, some of you having a vision and the glory of God is around here and there are some sort of evil things all around surrounding the curses that people try to throw on this place and curses try to put on those people who come and go. Why should you be afraid? You know what will happen to them? They'll be but like Balaam. Balaam tried to curse Israel. God said, you cannot. Every time you try to curse, a blessing come out. Plus, the blessings of Abraham are on you. Blessed are those who bless you. Cursed are those who curse you. There is a sort of reflector. So when the curse comes, the reflector reflects it back. Cursed are those who curse you. You don't even have to do anything. You don't even have to bind, 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 bind. Now, holy there, sometimes the Holy Spirit may lead you to bind. But don't use it as a formula. Just as sometimes the Holy Spirit may, may tell you to feed on someone and get them healed. But don't make it for a formula and start a spitting ministry. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will tell you to bind before you cast. You do it. But the problem comes and people take one work of the Spirit and make it the only way the Holy Spirit can work. Generally, all you have to do is just keep worshipping God, praising God, worshipping God, praising God. Satan could set a trap on your left, on your right. You're just praising God. The Holy Spirit tells you there's a trap in front of you. You may not even know. And you're just praising God and you're walking straight into a, into a trap and the Holy Spirit says, turn left, you turn left, hallelujah, praise God. The devil is just scheming. Because he cannot track you. All you are doing is just praising God, worshipping God. So nothing will affect you. And here is Elijah. He's mocking all those false prophets. And remember, all of Israel were afraid. The whole Israelite nation were afraid of those idols. And there was Elijah saying, Call louder. Maybe he cannot hear. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's doing some meditation. He's taking his afternoon nap. Baal taking his afternoon nap. And in verse 29, in verse 28, they cried aloud and then they used knives and cut themselves. They did steal blood to try to bring rain. No way. 
Finally, it came to Elijah's turn. It was evening already. They had the whole day. Elijah only had a short time left. Elijah told them to pray. He was making sure. At that time, there was a drought. He wanted the people to know that for God to do it, it has to be a miracle. He, do, he doesn't make it easier for God. He makes it harder. There was the, the sacrifice, there was the wood. He said, put water on it. So there is no accident. Accident. No accidental fire. No accidental rubbing of the wood and an accident, accidental spark comes and takes fire. They put water, put it, put a lot of water. There's so much water in verse 35 that the water was all around and it looked more like a trench. It looked like a trench filled with water. There's a tremendous lesson for us here to learn and understand that when God tells you to do something, He will do it. God said, I will send rain. He will do it. When God tells you to do something, I believe God has told him all that he wanted to do about sending the fire also. Now God has spoken, he was confident of what God wanted him to do. He has no problem. And yet sometimes we find some people saying, God tell me to do this and this ministry. And halfway through, they give up or they do something else and say somehow, somewhere, fail. What was the reason? I believe they had to check whether God really told them. Because when God tells you something, it always comes to pass. Even if it's difficult, even if it's hard, even if men make it harder, sometimes people launch forth into what they believe God told them to do. Things get difficult, and they say it's more difficult now, so it cannot come to pass. No, the more difficult it is, the greater the glory. The more impossible it is, the greater the miracle. God had to wait until Abraham was stirred up to give him the promised son so that he needs two miracles, not just one. When God first promised him a son, Sarah was barren. He was still alright. To prove it, when he lived with Hagar, he could have a natural son. So, according to Romans chapter 4, that when, when they reached a point of time when Sarah's womb was already dead and Abraham's body was dead, he needed two miracles now. If God had answered his prayer earlier, he needed only one miracle. But now it was so hard, he needed two miracles. And that was when God chose to bring up the promised son. So that Abraham will realize it was neither Sarah nor him. It was God's power working on both of them. And it was solely God who did it, not even his own strength. It was supernatural strength. And the more difficult the situation, the greater the glory. Some of you, when you pray for people, you should have this attitude. When you see a, a difficult case of healing, you should say, Hallelujah, more power. Sometimes when people go in the healing ministry, they, they pray for someone who has a cold or flu. Alright, alright. Next person, paralyzed. No. <laughs> uh, more difficult. See, your mind is unrenewed. It needs training. You need to realize that there's no difference for God between healing a cancer and healing a cold. No difference whatsoever. It's all in the mind that blocks God. So the next time you see a, a, a fully gone case person, that's when the greatest glory will demonstrate for. And sometimes when you start praying, it seems to get worse. No problem, keep on. If Lazarus sent the news that, uh, that uh, his sister sent news that he was sick, if Jesus had arrived there, there would have been a healing. But Jesus delayed, and they don't need a healing, they need a resurrection. Hallelujah. It's no problem to God if your situation gets worse. In fact, when it gets worse, you should praise God even more. You say, more glory, more power coming. Some of you, now we're talking about healing. Some of you are also praying for financial areas in your life. It seems to get worse. Let me tell you that, that the harder it is, it seems, the harder it is, 
the greater and the bigger the blessing. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus a clap offering for that. No problem for him. No problem for him. We must renew our mind to the attitude that all things are no problem for God. And so here is Elijah of Mount Carmel having all those things filled with water. And he prayed a simple prayer. He didn't pray a long winded prayer. By the time he finished, it was come midnight. He prayed a short, simple prayer. Remember the prayers that are most powerful in your life are those you pray from your heart, that you mean it. You don't need long prayers. And remember, don't have the attitude, the, the wrong teaching, that the harder the miracle, the longer the prayer. I'm getting rid of all these final points. See, sometimes you pray for a flu or cold. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Then comes someone to be raised. By the life. You pray, pray, rub the leg a bit. Give a little spiritual massage. That's why well open a spiritual massage shop. So remember, it is not more uh, prayer. It is all the same unto God. We must renew our mind to understand that it is the same. A miracle is a miracle. It does not even overload God's power. No problem whatsoever. He make it very difficult for God. In fact, he put water all over the place. Then he prayed a very simple prayer. He says, Hear me, O Lord, in verse 37. Hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord and that you have turned their hearts back. Back to you again. The moment he said that, one sentence only. The fire of God came down. The whole thing was burned. The waters were all wiped out, evaporated. And the sacrifice was burning. Every one of them bowed down and said, The Lord, He is God. 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 And while the people were at it, Elijah said, Let's kill all the other false prophets. Hallelujah. By that time, he got all the people on his side. And immediately, all the 850 prophets were killed. Then only God could send rain. What was the cause of the drought? The curse? The false prophets. The false worship. Elijah knew that was a root. It would have done no good just to pray for rain when the curse the root of the curse was not removed. So he got all the roots removed and he turned to King Ahab in verse 41 Go up, eat and drink for there is the sound of abundance of rain. Remember, he was seeing in the spirit he was hearing in the spirit. Nobody else heard it. If you are a man of faith and a man or woman of God, you will operate in the invisible realm. While people operate in the visible realm. And let me tell you, the invisible realm is more enjoyable and higher and it works. The visible realm will sometimes give up on you. If you go by circumstances, you will always be discouraged, you will always be down. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, We look not to the visible, we look to the invisible. Every man or woman of God, from Noah, Abraham, right up to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right to all the apostles, have been men who look into the invisible. They hear the abundance of rain. They see the miracles in the spirit realm. They see the victory of God. When the visible realm, in the visible realm, there was no evidence whatsoever. And let me say this. If you are a born again Christian and you're living in the visible realm, you're backslided. It's a hard word. <laughs> we are born of the spirit of God. God is invisible. The spirit realm is invisible. 
You are called to a great task. We are to overcome the world, not let the world overcome us. All things that are seen are subject to change. Say that again. Subject to Shout it out. So Elijah walked in that realm of the invisible. He says, I hear the abundance of rain. Everybody will look at him like they will look at Noah. Noah says there's going to be a flood. Nobody has seen a flood before. Nobody has heard of rain. That time rain has not even existed. We speak of the things of God. We speak of the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to the carnal man. You are born again Christian. I urge you to develop your spirit in the invisible realm. In the invisible realm. Hear the abundance of rain. And here goes Ahab. Here he goes on his chariot. I mean he's heading hard. There he goes on his chariot. Who? Hallelujah. Hey, excuse me, he may not say hallelujah. Not quite that nice a king. He said, get up, get up, get up. And while he was going all along the way, suddenly he heard a sound next to him. It sounds like a BMW. He goes, Push. Say, what, what was that? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Elijah. Went past him. That was, a, that was an anointing of God for him. Some of you who are in sports probably need that kind of anointing. Then he, he ran past the king. Powerful in verse 46. The hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He girded up his sarong. And he ran ahead of King Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Faster than road runner, faster than Billy the Week. He was fast. The anointing of God was on him. The anointing of God to do supernatural things. Hallelujah. Do you all know that the anointing on your life as a believer will make you do supernatural things that are impossible naturally? According to your need. King David was called to be a king. As a king, he will have to fight many wars. And do you know what he said? What the anointing of God is to do in his life? Turn with me to Samuel. That's right. Second Samuel. Samuel. In his Psalm, Psalm chapter 22, verse 33 to 35. God is my strength. Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 33 to 35. God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now that will be Samson's anointing on him. Whatever God has called you to do, God asks you to do not by your ability, but by His anointing. I believe David as a young boy, all he had was the, was, was the natural uh, youth, but when Samuel anointed him, the anointing of God came on him, and he told King Saul when he was facing Goliath, he says, King Saul, with my hand, when a lion came to take the sheep, I grabbed the lion and took the sheep out of his mouth, killed the lion, and when a bear came, I killed the bear. And who is this Goliath? The anointing of God is sufficient. Whatever your profession, whatever your vocation, whatever work you're doing, if, if you're an accountant, be a super one. If you're a manager, be a super one. If you're an employee, God can give you a supernatural ability to do according to your needs. Whatever your needs are, God is going to give that special anointing. 
See, King David was a man of war. You would not have heard of a man of war having supernatural strength under someone who, who had a need, came on the anointing of God and broke into the realm. But there are many before us. King Solomon needed wisdom. God gave wisdom. If there's any new king and any new invention that is needed on this planet for the body of Christ, God will give the body of Christ an anointing and they will break into it. The anointing will break into the natural realm. So there you have Elijah running supernaturally, overtaking the horse. It's never ever heard before of a man overtaking a horse. But he did it. He reached the gates of Jezreel before King Ahab. King Ahab went home. Jezebel said, Good evening, and where are my prophets? King Ahab said, All finish off. Elijah finished them off. Jezebel was mad. Jezebel was angry. Jezebel was going to kill Elijah. Remember, Elijah has gone into the city. And Elijah and Jezebel sent a man, a message to Elijah saying, If I get my hands on you, I'm going to finish you up too. Finito! Hallelujah. And you think what the mighty man of God did? Great man. He has tasted the anointing of God. Tasted the fire of God. Stop the rain. Start the rain. <laughs> Wonderful ministry. One woman chased him. He ran for his life. 850 prophets not afraid a bad king with authority not afraid one woman ran so man I'm just advising you one woman is equal to 850 men they are powerful and he was so down he ran for his life, sat down under a tree. And while he was sitting under the tree, he was complaining to God, He is like you and I. Sometimes, you do get tempted to be discouraged. You have the opportunity to give up. Every sincere and honest man of God who succeeds in the ministry will tell you they have an opportunity. I did not say that they fall for it, but they have an opportunity to be discouraged, an opportunity to give up. Otherwise, you wouldn't be true to the human uh, choice, element of choice that you are offered. In every victory, there is always a choice of a failure. Even Jesus himself was given the opportunity to fail. In every success, there's an opportunity to fail. But don't take it. Elijah was down. Elijah was discouraged. Discouragement is nothing new to any one of you. It's something that Satan puts on you. What happened to Elijah? This is what happened. He was moving in the invisible realm all the time. Floating on cloud nine. Invisible realm. Hallelujah. 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 Suddenly he moved back into the natural realm. He saw Jezebel's face and make up run. What happened to him? He moved down into the natural realm. Every man or woman of God, myself included, yourself included, as long as you remain in the realm of the spirit, Satan cannot defeat you. But the moment you move down into the natural realm, you are a nice prey and target for the devil to run you down. As long as you don't get out of the realm of the spirit, you are in the secret place of the Most High God. Nothing can come near you. Nothing can touch you. But if you, by your own choice, 
choose to turn your eyes back on the natural, your ears back on the natural, your vision back on the natural, your circumstances. What was Elijah complaining? He was complaining about his circumstances. He said, God, here am I. I mean, uh, my life is at stake now. Here am I looking at all these things. What has become of him? He has come down to the natural. So don't be surprised. If any man or woman or girl will be used greatly by God, suddenly you hear that they have come down to the natural land, they have gone and been cast aside in the ministry. Nothing surprising because we are all having the glory of God in earthen vessels. We have a choice to remain in the spirit or to come down to the natural. If you choose to come down to your natural, I don't care what your name may be, your name may be TL or your name may be Hagen. You would be under the same temptation as every other ordinary man. You would be at a place where every other man or woman goes through. There's nothing special about any man or woman of God. The only thing special is what they have contained in them. God's treasure in them. But they are as natural as you and I. So God says, don't come down to the natural. Elijah came down to the natural. And he said, God, I don't want that lady to kill me. Please kill me. Hero. Kill me, Lord. Let me die here under this tree. He is not praying a sincere prayer. There is one time when God doesn't answer his prayer. You know, sometimes you pray foolish prayers and you pound at the gates of heaven, you shake the gates and rattle the gates of heaven. You go angry with God why God doesn't answer. One year later you say, Thank you, Lord. No, you didn't answer then. Ha ha ha. You all look so innocent as if you've never done that before. I can tell you I have. And I have. Early in my ministry, I mean I pray some funny prayers. I ask God for some things and uh, some areas. And uh, I'm glad He did not, he did not uh, answer me in that area. See, sometimes men of God tell you their successes, they hide all their failures behind. But what you need sometimes is to hear sometimes where they fail so that you can be encouraged that, oh, then they are the same like me. So that you don't put them on the pedestal. When I first went to, into the ministry, I thought I was, I mean, holy, holy, super, super, I want to be a super saint. Say, God, I think I would like a single life. The holy man of God. You obviously know by now that the prayer was not heard. I knew not what I prayed. God knew back. And uh, one of the blessings of the family life is that my own character has been molded. I could never have the character I have today if not for the marriage life, family life that is trained and molded me. I'm not suggesting that all of you singles marry quickly. Neither am I suggesting that God may not have called you to a single life. It is a precious life. That was one of the reasons, you know what? I was wanting to aim for the 144,000. It's revelation. I didn't understand. I know it not what I prayed. And know it not I also not the scripture. What it actually means, anyway. So, there's blessing. Paul was a single man. Jesus was a single man. Let me encourage those of you who are single, that you have a special reward too. God has a special gift for you. And let me encourage you, even if you have no family, the family of God is your family. Amen. Your family, call on each other. It's, your, it's a better, bigger family than you ever had. Praise God. Those of you single parents, be encouraged. The family of God is sufficient for you. And remember, it's a gift of God on your life. So I'm the minister to both sides. And encourage you all to reach out into God, the death and the rent of God. And those of you who are married, 
You're going to also have special rewards for your tribulation in your family. Anyway, excuse me, I mean your blessings in your family life. But there are many things that you're rubbing each other, many things you're molding each other's life. Some of your weak points that are hidden when you live alone, come out when you live together. God rubs and God molds you. Like Paul says, there's a gift for this and a gift for that. Different areas of life. So, discouragement is common to all. You would have the opportunity to fail. Elijah was sitting there and that was one prayer he cried to God. God did not answer. God did not answer. How many realize that God is wiser than us? He is wiser than us. Amen. God is bigger and more smart than us. That's why better... Ask him first what to pray before you pray. He knows best. And Elijah was not sincere. He asked for God to take his life. He wanted to go home. But if he really meant what he said, he would have stayed and let Jezebel kill him off. See, he prayed to die. Jezebel wanted to have him die. Do him a favor. If that is what he wanted. He was not sincere. Thank God He answered the desires and the deep things that are actually in your heart, not just the outward. See, sometimes you stumble and you fumble with your words. But God understands the true desires in your heart. God understood what I meant when I was telling Him, I want to consecrate myself to Him fully in the ministry. I still could consecrate myself today. But there are some things that I prayed and I talk to God that I did not understand and have the knowledge today as I look back I also laugh at myself that is why don't treat God like a supermarket everything you demand 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 but God is your father relate to him converse with him if you are not clear about something say God I am not sure about this but let me talk it over with you just pour your heart out onto God he is your father you have a shoulder to lean on God showed it So while he was discouraged, God dealt with his life. God said, Elijah, go aside. So Elijah went aside to a cave, hid himself in the cave. While he was in a cave, he was waiting on God to tell him something. And in the cave, he heard the power of God manifest etc we are now in uh, 1st Kings chapter 19 chapter 19 while Elijah was crying and weeping himself out God sent an angel to him and the angel gave him the food and after that food he went and it lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He went to a cave in verse 9, chapter 19, verse 9. And the first thing God said in verse 9, What are you doing? Have you ever been down and discouraged, feeling that you are the only one in the world? And God has sort of ruffled your fur and said, Son, what are you doing? What are you really doing? He was trying to show Elijah what he is doing. That he has left the spirit realm and become a, in the natural realm. While he was in the natural realm, he replied to God and he said, Lord, I am zealous. Let me read exactly what he said in 1 Kings uh, 19. He says, I, in verse 10, have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He had an eye problem. You can always tell when a man or God has backslided when they start using a lot of I. 
I this, I that, I this, I that. I'm the only one who could do this. I'm the only one who could do that. There's no one, that, nothing that, that like me. I'm special. I'm the only one. He had that self-centered syndrome. He had eye problem. He had self-centered syndrome. He had the matter complex. I am the only one. He had the Zero pride. I'm the only one left. If I die, you got no one left, God. You need me, oh God. That's what he's saying. Basically, he has turned his eyes away from God to himself. And let me encourage you here. If you ever take the eyes, your eyes, from God and look at yourself even in the midst of the way God used you you will straight away falter because in yourself you realize you're rotten there's nothing 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 that you can do for God and here is pride coming out in his life he had to deal with his pride I'm the only one left. Oh Lord. I'm the only one left. And they are seeking to destroy me. And I like God. He's so gentle. Remember, if you have shown great sacrifices to God, you have done wonderful things to God, our God is having a great compassion and gratitude. If you think a human being can be uh, very appreciative of what you do to them, think about our Father God. Why is He so kind to this disobedient, backslided son called Elijah? Because Elijah has actually did his best to love him too. Don't think that our God is the God who the moment you fall, He snaps you off. That's you. He's not. He took Elijah gently and slowly dealt with him. Here, he says, Go and stand on the mountain. The Lord passed by in verse 11. A great strong wind tore into the mountain, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. What is it saying here? The wind, the earthquake, the fire went before the Lord. Sometimes, we have known the power of God, we have known the might of God, we have known the fire of God. Don't forget, God is the person to relate to Him one to one. Don't just know the power of God, know the person of God. Don't just know the gifts of God and the calling of God on your life, but know God personally. See, Elijah, up to this time, he had tapped on the, the gifts of God and the office that he sent in as a prophet. He had tapped on the power of God. I mean, if you could pray fire down, you had tapped onto something. He had tapped on the power of God. He had tapped on the fire of God. He had tapped on all these things, but yet he has not known God fully. Now, he did know God to a certain extent. To do that, you must have known God to a certain extent. And let me encourage you, no matter what you think that you have known of God, you must always have the attitude, there is still some more of God to know. So much more. So much more. Even Paul, after all the wonderful things that God did, said, Oh, that I may know Him. See, God was correcting him and this is what God was doing. 
God was turning his eyes away from his circumstances back to the spirit realm. Back to the spirit realm. God showed his power and then a still small voice came. Those of you who have known God mightily in fire, in wind, in earthquake, you need to know God's still small voice. When Elijah heard the still small voice, he quickly come out because he know now it was God. Before was just the might of God. Now it was God. Before is the presence of God. Now it's the person of God. And he came to God and God spoke to him. God talked about judgment coming. See what Elijah needs is encouragement. What Elijah needs is encouragement. And here, God said three things to him in 1 Kings 19. God says in verse uh, 15, Anoint the king of Syria. Verse 16, Anoint Jehu. And verse 18, uh, 17, 16 and 17, and anoint Elisha. God said three things to him. But the most significant is the last one. You know what Elijah means? He was single. He needed encouragement. And God said, Go and get Elisha. Elisha will be with you. Hallelujah. See, God takes care of every one of your needs. You know, Elijah is a bit lonely there. Say, I am the only one. Now God is going to make sure he knows he's not the only one. He's going to tell him and say, appoint and anoint Elisha to stand in your place together as a prophet. Is he going to be alone anymore? Hello? No. God takes care of every need. I was reading a biography recently of a, a doctor who was killed and who saw Jesus and Jesus sent the doctor back. He was a lady doctor. She was kidnapped, killed, and she was in the air. She saw her body there. In the air, or in the, there was a cloud, and she saw Jesus. Jesus met her and suddenly out of nowhere two chairs appeared for them to sit. Jesus sat on one chair, she sat on one chair. And this is the part I want to share with you. The chair that Jesus made appear that for her to sit on was the chair that she used to sit on when she was small with her own father. And her own father used to comfort her and talk with her and share with her while on that chair. So it brought back sweet memory. And this was what her thought that came when she saw the chair. She said, Jesus so loved us that these small, small details, she take care to remind you of all those beautiful times. Now it was a different chair but it looked so similar to bring back those beautiful memories. Isn't that like our Lord Jesus? So Elijah was lonely. Get Elisha. And to let him know he is not alone, he says, By the way, I have 7,000 more, like you, who have not bowed their knees to Baal. And Elijah was brought back into the spirit realm. This time, God changed his ministry a bit because he had a companion a companion to serve him called Elisha 
And Elijah was going to be together with him now for the rest of his ministry. He is kind. God is kind. He is loving. He will take care of the most detailed areas of your life. The small, small things that will make you happy, that will bring joy to you, God does it. I mean, He's so great, it looks like a waste of time to do that for us. But He will do it. He takes care of the minute details to bring us joy and happiness. And from that day onwards, Elijah learned to walk with God. And this is a phrase that you find constantly in his life. He always says, As the Lord lives and as I live, before whom I stand, he always learned to be in the presence of God. To remain in the presence of God. In fact, he lived so much in the presence of God from that day onwards. You never hear any more of that kind of going down, falling. So that one day God said, Elijah, we have been together so long. Why don't you just come up and join me? Hallelujah. And by the way, I will send you a fiery chariot to escort you here. And so, by that time, he had a group of prophets with him. See, his ministry changed. I encourage you, sometimes from the crisis of your life, comes a change of your ministry in a greater way. Before that, Elijah was a lone ranger, God gave him Tonto and God gave him a school of prophets. You see later on, when he was about to go off, there was a school of prophets. See now he's training other prophets. A change in his ministry. Sometimes when, when you're struggling in yourself to, to perform more, you're going to give you to a certain extent, but you seem to be here on this low level, it is because it's time for a change. Time for improvement, time for a greater anointing on your life, time for your ministry not to decrease, but to increase to the glory of God. He walks so close to God, which one of my desires is that I could walk so close to God that I could be like Him, just walk, with, walk into God. It's a shame that we do not read of it in the New Testament. If in the Old Covenant, they could have at least two men who walk so close with God that they just walk into God's glory. How much more in the New Testament? With the blood of Jesus and with all that Jesus has done, we could have more people to walk closer with God. Would you be that man or woman? Walk so close with God. Walk so close with God. That God loves your companionship so much. He doesn't need us, but He loves us. God loves your companionship so much. God says, come on up and join me here. God is going to make more and more people like that. And in the last days, the whole church in the whole world is going to walk so close with God. And this is how the rapture takes place. God is going to say, Hey fellows, you are walking so close, just come on home. See, it's a perfect church that God calls home. It's a church that walks so close with God. Every believer walking with God. Every believer loving God, worshipping God. So close, a perfect church that God says, just come on home. Come on home. And we are all raptured. Stand with me to your feet. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely Take me, Jesus, take me 
นาไอ้ surrender ไอ้ surrender Just sing it with all your hearts under God.